right, so we're going back to Vienna. All right, and this is the Schönbrunn Zoo. This is the oldest zoo they claim in the world. So we don't know. Everybody always claims they're the oldest in the world. But in any event, the oldest world, oldest zoo, at least in Europe. And so this is right on the grounds of the Schönbrunn Palace. And, and you've got, here you can see this is one of the residents after a night on call, <laughs> totally exhausted. <laughs> Relaxing, you know, eating all those Cheetos that are in the machine because that's all you have time to eat. And some um, black bears. They're kind of cool because I'm not sure what kind of black bear this is because they've got this little facial coloring on them here. And your obligatory polar bears, which are always fun to watch. And again, these are a couple of residents lamenting the weekend call. <laughs> oh, God, primary called me a hundred times. All right, enough. So we want to talk about the optic nerve today. And when we're talking about the optic nerve, I mean, you guys are all aware of the picture of the optic nerve. And so when you're looking in at the optic nerve, you know, first of all, it's, the border should be sharp. It should be flat, it shouldn't be elevated, it shouldn't be depressed or, or, or concave. You know, the color is kind of this, you know, pink, sometimes yellow color, but it shouldn't be white. And you see that there's no hemorrhages around there, there's no uh, vessel engorgement in there. So that's a, a normal looking optic nerve. And here's the optic nerve in a sagittal view. And so when we think of the optic nerve anatomy, all right, um, I like to use the analogy of a fiber optic cable. So first of all, optic nerve is made up of the ganglion cell axons, which then come out through the nerve fiber layer through the lamina cribrosa. Tina, what happens to the axons once they get beyond the lamina cribrosa? They become myelinated. So there are oligodendrocytes that live in the optic nerve here that myelinate them. So think of an axon as a single fiber and it's got myelin around it. So it's got, it's, an op, it's, a, it's a fiber optic cable. It's got a little bit of insulation around it. Now, they're also organized into these columns right here. And Vaish, what, what goes in between these columns of these axons here? Uh, the peel septae. The peel septae. So this is like a bundle of those, you know, fiber optic bundles that are right there. And then finally, the entire cable is buried in the ground with steel around it. And then what surrounds the whole cable there? The optic nerve sheath. All right, so each individual axon has myelin, which the oligodendrocytes put on it once you go posterior to the lamina cribrosa. And then they're bundled together and they get into these columns with these little peel septae that are going along. And then the whole thing is wrapped in the optic nerve sheath. All right. And here we can see it in cross section. All right. So, optic nerve sheath. Let's see. So, Brad, what uh, what is this tissue underneath here? Um, so we have the uh, arachnoid and the subarachnoid space. All right. So remember, this is the second cranial nerve, and so just like the brain, it's got dura around it, i.e., the optic nerve sheath, and then it's got the arachnoid granulations subarachnoid space, what runs in here? Um, so you have the little like arachnoid processes. What else is in here though? Um, so you have vessels as well. What is in this empty space here? Fluid, CSF. Exactly, CSF. And so that, that's important. <laughs> CSF flows through there. So anything that increases CSF pressure could be transmitted out to the optic nerve. And that's important to remember that. What are these two structures right here? <clears throat> central retinal artery, central retinal vein. All right, so remember we talked last time how the artery and the vein share a common adventitial sheath. So you can see right here where arterial sclerosis can push on the vein next to it that can cause stasis. So arterial sclerosis not only causes central artery occlusion, but central vein occlusion. All right, so what are we showing right here? Rachel, just keep going around. So this looks, oh, this is the, the sheath um, here. Right, so there's the optic nerve sheath. What are these guys here? Uh, those arachnoid granulations. Exactly. These are the little arachnoid granulations. When you look at these, uh, oh, another question here. What stain is this? For 
bonus points. Yeah, I wish I knew. I don't know. This is a trichrome stain. So, you know, trichrome stains, connective tissue, blue. It stains kind of mesenchymal tissue, nervous tissue, red. So this shows you the optic nerve sheath, the arachnoid, arachnoid granulations, and then these are the little PL septae, kind of separating off the bundles of the optic nerve uh, as it comes down. And here you can see it in kind of a longitudinal cut. Here you can see the PL septae, the axons here. Now, we had said oligodendrocytes live in the optic nerve. What's another cell body that lives in the optic nerve? Teresa? Ganglion. Oligodendrocytes are glial cells. All right. What more specific? Actually, astrocytes. So astrocytes live in the optic nerve, too. So when you think about what kind of tumors you can get of the optic nerve, astrocytes lived in there, so you can get astrocytomas. And there are some little microglial cells in there that do a little bit of cleanup action, but remember there's astrocytes that kind of live here, and their cell bodies are kind of in between here in the, the columns of the axons. Here again, just showing you that common adventitial sheath between the central retinal artery and the vein. All right, we're just going to show a few simple things. I guess we'll just go back around the room. Yeah. What are we showing here? Uh, view of the optic nerve. Uh, on the temporal side, it, it, there's that paler tissue, which probably is a sclera. Uh, so it could potentially be like a small coloboma. Not quite a coloboma yet, but that's a good, that's a good thought. But if, if you look at this, boy, that nerve is just really small. You've got kind of almost a double ring around here. So this is optic nerve hypoplasia. Pretty common entity that you can see. And the interesting thing about this is it really doesn't affect the vision a whole lot. I mean, you look inside, and these people tend to have normal vision. It's bilateral. It even can run in families. So this is a hypoplastic nerve. You know, as opposed to like the crescent that you get in a myopic nerve, you know, which is a big nerve and you get a big crescent around it where you can see the sclera showing through. This is a tiny nerve. You kind of see almost a double crescent around it. So this is a hypoplastic optic nerve. All right, Chris, what is this? So this looks more like an optic nerve coloboma. Optic nerve coloboma, exactly. What is a coloboma? Coloboma is where you have failure of um, like embryonic fissure to close. Okay. So we have um, basically split the layers here. So we're looking basically, I think, at like sclera here. So if you remember when the eye is forming, you get indentation of the neuroectoderm, and then it forms kind of that bilayered cup. But then as the vessels are coming in, you start to get it sealing off, and it seals off at the equator and then moves forward and backward. So when you get colobomas, it's usually at the front part of that, which is inferiorly in the iris, or it's at the back where it seals off, which is inferiorly at the optic nerve. So this is failure of that original embryonic fissure to close. And this is just bare sclera you're looking at here. Now this can affect vision because, you know, you've got some intact fibers here, but you're going to have a big, um, you know, superior arcuate defect or big superior altitudinal defect there because these are inferior and that's actually just kind of bare sclera that you're looking at. This is kind of what I call the most severe form of a coloboma. Catherine, what is this? Exactly. So what's the name we put on this? Uh, morning, glory. morning glory. And so you can see it's almost like it's, it's out of focus because it's almost like it's pushing away from you. It's, it's pouching out. The reason it's called a morning glory malformation is this is the morning glory plant. And so it looks like a trumpet horn. So if you think about it, this is like a big trumpet horn moving away from you. So this is kind of the <coughs> ultimate optic nerve coloboma. This is a morning glory syndrome. And um, this is the morning glory plant. That's why it's named that way. All right, what are we looking at here? Tina. So there's a kind of a small outpouching uh, at around 4 o'clock in the nerves that looks like a, like a small optic pit. All right, so that's another thing that can form there. And people have argued if optic nerve pits are 
kind of put together with coal Obamas or not, or if they can occur separately. And I still think we don't know exactly what causes an optic nerve pit, but you can see right here, there's this little optic nerve pit that's there. And when you look at it, this is actually the pathology. You'll see that there's this little pit that's right here. Now, what do we worry about with an optic pit that can affect vision? So the biggest thing is you can get a little bit of fluid underneath the macula there. Okay. And so that's the exactly. So fluid can leak out where this optic nerve pit is, and it could actually leak out, because usually these are temporal, and it'll leak out underneath the macula. So you can get this this um, fluid underneath the macula and you actually get a little focal detachment of the macula. And some people will argue that this fluid is, is CSF, others will argue that it's got some components of vitreous in it. And so what you worry about is not so much that you get that focal nerve fiber layer defect, but that you can get leakage of fluid. And these are tough to treat because it's not like you can put a wall of laser here to get rid of the fluid because if you do, then you'll have a huge, you know, scotoma in your macula. And so these are very, very difficult to treat. What are we looking at right here, Vaish? Um, so we have these, um, looks like the nerve fiber layer is, has this whitening, so it's probably because it's myelinated. Okay, so remember we talked about myelination starting posteriorly to the lamina cribrosa. And what's interesting is, is when the optic nerve grows, the nerve grows, you know, from the, from the brain, from the original, you know, embryologic um, outpouching that comes out, the nerve will grow out, but the myelination starts at the lamina cribrosa and then grows back toward the, you know, toward the optic chiasm and, and backward. But sometimes some of those um, oligodendrocytes can end up forward to the lamina cribrosa and then you'll get myelinated nerve fiber layer. Now, these are usually congenital. So when you look at these, they're, they're there from the first time the kid is examined. And it's important that you note these because you don't want, you know, a guy to get in a car accident and then they go to the ER and someone looks at an undilated pupil and says, oh my God, papilledema. You know, they start drilling holes in the patient's skull to relieve pressure. You know, so I always let patients know. I say, you've got a curiosity in there. Some of the insulation on the, on the nerve fibers that shouldn't be in the eye is in the eye. So if anybody ever looks in your eye and says, oh my God, just let them know that this has been there since you were born. And so, now, interestingly enough, this really doesn't cause a whole lot of, of vision symptoms. I mean, you might, if you really check carefully, you could get like a big blind spot or some focal scotoma here, but, you know, the nerve fibers still function through that area. It's just that the myelin will, you know, dampen down the light getting through some of the fibers underneath it. So this is one of those things that kind of looks pretty exciting and alarming and the patient doesn't notice a thing. What are we looking at, right? Yeah, so at here. the kind of the you know the cup disc uh, margin, you're seeing these things almost look like exudates. They're these yellowish spots that look like optic nerve drusen. All right. So what exactly are optic nerve drusen? Uh, so they're calcifications, um, and so they're they wouldn't show up um, unless you you know you you may not know what they are until you do like an ultrasound. Exactly. Now, these are sometimes, if they're buried, they're really hard to discern. And so sometimes people will come in and they'll actually be referred in for uh, papilledema. And they'll be concerned that there is an elevation of the optic nerve head. And you look in here, and this one is a little bit more prominent. You can actually see the little bumps in there. But you know, if you just looked at this, this nerve head is, is elevated. It's, it's pushing up toward you. But it's because of these bumps here. And so when Drusen are on the surface, you know, you can see them pretty readily, but when they're buried, then it becomes tricky because you, you often can't see them when they're buried. So this is just showing you some of the different presentations. Here you can see, again, classic Drusen. You can see them here. Here, yeah, pretty good, but sometimes it's just a little hard to make those out when they're, when they're buried deep. And, of course, this is an end stage. This is rare that, you know, they'll, you'll get it to this area. This is an end stage. Drusen, you see how the vessels are all compromised. Now, you know, it's tough to tell sometimes the difference between papilledema and buried drusen. And so that's a tough thing. And so you mentioned one of the things that we can do to tell the difference, which well, is... You, you, know, you can do an 
ultrasound. An ultrasound. And so because these drusen, they're, they're hyalinized, but they have a lot of calcium in them, calcium reflects ultrasound. And so if you take a B scan, and you know, Dr. Harry is wonderful at doing this, but you guys can even do this. You know, you take a B scan in the retina clinic and you just get the shadow to where the optic nerve is coming out and you slowly turn the gain down. And what'll happen is a lot of the eye will disappear, but the little bright spots around the optic nerve will stay there because as the sound waves hit that calcium, it bounces back really strong. So calcium gives you a strong signal back. And you can even see it on a CT scan. And boy, I'm sorry, I copied this and that's bad. We'll have to get a newer one. But you can see that, that the Drusen just kind of light up here on a CT scan. This shows it better. Here you go. Is it usually bilateral? It, it is bilateral, but can be asymmetric. So sometimes you'll see it and you'll say, oh, it's unilateral, but then you can do a scan and you'll find that it, it'll be buried sometimes. So this is a better one. See right here and here. And this shows you an actual eye that has been uh, cut in half sagittally. This is the optic nerve head going out, and here's a large calcified drusen. It's in front of the lamina cribrosa, kind of underneath the parenchyma of the optic nerve. And then here we have a, a nice path specimen. Here's the um, center of the eye over here. Here's the optic nerve going back, lamina cribrosa. And here we have this calcified, hyalinized Jews and sitting in front of the optic nerve and then underneath the nerve fiber. So you can get focal nerve fiber layer defects from these Drusen. The problem is, again, we don't have treatment for these. And so I'll send them to Brad Katz because he's really interested in following up these people, but I, you really can't do much with them. And so fortunately, people don't get serious lo you know, uh, loss of vision. They'll often get some focal um, you know, bundle type visual field defects. Here's another one. Jews and buried here. Dr. Mamelis. Sir. Have you ever found in your, uh, in your experience that giving them anti-glaucoma medications has slowed down the progression of any uh, field loss, or have you not really seen that? Good question. People have, have said that if the optic nerve fibers are compromised already with this drusen underneath them that even a slight increase in pressure can maybe cause further loss. And so you certainly want to keep the eye pressure as low as you possibly can. But there's been no good evidence that the so-called neuroprotective, either pills or drops, do anything with these. But you definitely want to make sure that you don't put even a moderate pressure on top of this. All right, Brad, what are we seeing here? So this is a color from this photo of the nerve. We can see <clears throat> that there, um, there are some blurred disc margins consistent with optic nerve edema. Um, I don't see any hemorrhages, really. So uh, this is an end stage, but it's definitely, I don't know, stage two. Okay. Well, and you really got to be careful, and I'm glad you said it the way you did. You said optic nerve edema. Papilledema, you can get, I got nailed on oral boards on this. Papilledema, by definition, is optic nerve swelling secondary to increased intracranial pressure. And so you can have swollen discs from other things. And so be careful if someone shows you a picture of this on boards and you say, okay, this is a swollen disc. If this were bilateral and associated with increased intracranial pressure, we would call it papilledema. So be very careful to do that because the, the guy kept saying, oh, so, hmm, you could tell pap... And so then I said, oh, and then I had to stop myself. I said, no, 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 okay, it's a swollen disc. If the other disc were, you know, elevated and the pressure were high, it would be papilledema. And then he goes, they never tell you yes, correct, when you do a normal voice. They go... Okay, and then they flip the page, so <laughs> they don't give you any feedback. So, but there are other reasons for an optic nerve to be swollen aside from papilledema. So be careful when you do your definitions. All right, so this is just one that's probably more severe. And, and what do we see in here in addition to what he saw in the previous one? <clears throat> Seeing hemorrhages yeah, and more tortuosity of the, of the, the vessels. Right, so tortuous vessels. 
hemorrhages on the surface of the nerve. Obscuration of the vessels. Is exactly, well. obscuration. So this is a severe, um, whatever grade. There's one scale that goes from one to four. There's another scale that goes from one to five. This would be a four or a five, depending on what scale you look at. So severe, um, this turns out to be papilledema. Okay, so when we look at it, pathologically, here's the lamina cribrosa back here. Here's the edge of the sclera there. Look at the optic nerve head. It's markedly swollen, but look at how the vessels are engorged and look at the hemorrhages on the surface. So you get hemorrhages on the surface, you get engorgement of the vessels, you get it literally gets swollen and pushes forward, so pushes toward you when you're looking at it. So that's a classic path of papilledema. And you can even get forward bowing of the lamina cribrosa from the pressure coming from behind. So those are the lamina cribrosa fibers pushing forward. And so kind of the opposite of glaucoma. Remember we talked about glaucoma, how the fibers excavate and you know the lamina cribrosa gets pushed backwards. This, they're all pushed forward. So the opposite direction with papilledema. All right, what do we see in here? What else could cause kind of a picture like this? Something like NION could? Exactly. So you want to start thinking about ischemia. Okay. And so, you know, you want to worry about AION, you know, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And what is the two ways we kind of break that down? What are the two different things that can cause that? Exactly. So you always want to keep that in the back of your mind. You know, you don't want to miss an arteritic, you know, AION versus a non-arteritic AION. So a lot of it's going to be the history. So what's the history of a classic AION? Uh, someone in their early teens, maybe even early 50s to 60s, who has some um, 70s. Yeah, 70s. <laughs> sudden onset vision loss, it, like maybe not entirely, but like blurry in, in a particular area, completely painless, the other eye is fine. Um, and in fact, sudden so onset, that. oftentimes they'll even wake up with this. And so it's, it's like an, an old vasculopath, you know, old guy with diabetes and hypertension and, you know, he wakes up in the morning and says, gee, I just can't see out of part of my eye, something's funny. And the reason people think that's, that's it is, remember, your blood pressure kind of bottoms out right before dawn. And so oftentimes that's when these AIONs will occur. Now, what else, at least in an acute phase, can give you a funny swollen disc also aside from ischemia? How about or just, just optic Papilitis. neuritis or <clears throat> papillitis? Exactly. So you can also get... Um, you know, inflammatory, autoimmune, other things can cause it. So swollen disc, you know, you get one of these on boards, you're in big trouble because it, it can be anything. And so be sure when you do an oral board that you list as many things as you possibly can in order to do this. Sir? Yeah. What's the mechanism for looking swollen when you have an AION? Is it just the nerve fiber layers kind of dying out? And it it's actually swollen. So in, in ischemia, you actually get swelling from the ischemia. In um, optic neuritis, you actually get inflammation of the fibers behind there, and then you'll get secondary swelling coming up if it's acute. If it's acute. Now, sometimes you can get optic neuritis, the nerve looks fine, you don't see anything initially, and then you start to see, you know, losing of the normal color and pallor later on. All right, so the reason I wanted to show this is we. We said, as, as Rachel said, you know, you can get AION, and again, it's not arteritic, it's the person we talked about, but don't forget, you can get temporal arteritis, which is the arteritic form, and you don't want to miss the arteritic form because patient may present with loss of vision in one eye, but not only can they lose the vision in that eye, but if left untreated, they can lose vision in the second eye also. So you don't want to miss an AION. So, Teresa, what am I showing here?
and Tisha, the media, and the um, Intima? And All right, so I actually would like to start from the inside just because I'm OCD. So here's the lumen, here's the Intima. What is this layer right here? Internal lamina, and then here. Media. Muscular media, and then here. Advent tissue. Okay, so I want that artery right now. That's a normal artery. So if you do a temporal artery biopsy, that's what it looks like. Now, you, you may ask, why do ophthalmologists do temporal artery biopsies? That's a good question. It's just because historically patients present with sudden vision loss. And so, you know, usually we're the ones who do the biopsies. You know, you'd think that, you know, you'd refer to somebody else or the plastics guys would do them all. But, you know, even general ophthalmologists do temporal artery biopsies. It's just something in our purview because we see the patients. How does this look different than the previous picture? Yeah, look, the intima is massively thickened. You don't have internal elastic lamina is gone. Boy, muscular media, I, you know, I can't see anything at low power. And not only that, even at low power, there's these little tiny blue dots around the edge. So let's look at a higher power. And what do we see here? Thus the name. Some people call this giant cell arteritis. And so you get epithelioid in giant cells, and for some reason they cluster either internal to the uh, muscular media or external to the muscular media. So they can be around the internal elastic lamina, they can be external. People have argued, is this an attack on the internal elastic lamina? Is it an attack on the muscular media? Is there a bug in there? You know, for a while the rheumatologist and Brad were had me looking at a whole bunch of these to see if there was a specific bacteria that could cause these. Fortunately, it didn't turn out to be, but we still don't know exactly what causes this. We just know it's in older people. It's a disease not just of the, you know, the, the temporal artery or the short posterior ciliary arteries behind the nerve. It's a disease of kind of medium, small arteries through the entire head. In fact, even the entire upper body. And so these people may have loss of vision, but then you talk to them carefully and you say, do you have intermittent claudication? And then they go, what? You know, so, but so you want to ask them specific questions and you want to say, you know, when you chew something, does your jaw hurt? And they say, yeah. Do you have trouble getting up out of chairs? Do you feel stiff and tired all the time? You have like some low grade fevers. And so ask them for the, you know, polymyalgia rheumatica type questions and you'll find they often have these. So you don't want to miss temporal arteritis. All right, so Tina. You suspect temporal arteritis. You haven't had a biopsy yet. What blood test do you do? So you get ESRCRP. Okay, ESRCRP. Let's say the, they are high enough that you're suspicious. Then what do you do? You start them on steroids before you do a biopsy, and then you usually have, like, depending on who you talk to, one to two weeks yeah. after starting steroids to get the biopsy. And that's critical. Don't wait for the biopsy to start the treatment because, again, they could lose vision in the other eye if it's positive. But you want to get the biopsy within 7 to 10 days because sometimes if you're on steroids for a long period of time, it'll calm the inflammation and then the biopsy becomes difficult to read. You know, there is an entity that we call healed arteritis, but that's when, you know, I'll look at a biopsy and they'll say someone's been on steroids for a long time, nobody's done a biopsy. You look at it, you say, well, Internal elastic lamina is chewed up, muscular media is maybe gone, but it's a really iffy call. So you really want a positive diagnosis because steroids are nasty medicines, especially in old people. They can run into all kinds of side effects, so you want to know what you're treating. The worst thing we get here is someone's seen by a guy in the community, they have what sounds like temporal arteritis, they give them 40 of prednisone. First of all, 40 in a, in a good sized man is not enough to treat it anyway. And then, you know, they come back again two months later with side effects from the steroid and say, well, did they have it or didn't they? That's always tough to do. So know your diagnosis at first because we get a lot of negative biopsies here because we're a tertiary referral center. So we often get, you know, kind of the final dumping ground here. So we end up doing a lot of biopsies that are negative. Now, in a, in a pathology practice, they say you should have about 20 to 30 percent of your biopsies should be negative, meaning that you don't miss any. You're doing a little bit too, too much. In our lab, it's more like 90 to 95% negative. And so we just get a ton of 
you know, final referrals could this be? So we actually don't see as many positives. And this is that so-called healed arteritis. So here's the lumen, intima, kind of thickened, hard to see an internal and elastic lamina. Here's muscular media out here. Look, muscular media kind of absent there. No inflammation though. So this would be the so-called healed arteritis. So really know your diagnosis first. Vaish, what are we seeing here? So um, this view of the optic nerve, the, is the superior temporal margin looks kind of, the distal margin looks pretty blurred. Um, so it's kind of a sectoral loss. So it could be uh, from an ischemic cause, uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, non arteritic Okay, so you could think of ischemic optic neuropathy, but you look carefully, it's kind of fuzzy here, but boy, maybe that's a little bit of pallor there, so I don't know. Okay, now we'll, we'll help you out a little bit with the diagnosis. This person's 20. So it's more likely like an optic neuritis. Exactly. So one of the things that could help you is age. I mean, obviously, if someone comes in with a funny disc and they're 70, you're going to think more AION. If someone comes in with a funny disc and they're 20, you're going to be thinking more like an optic neuritis. And so this turns out to be more an optic neuritis. And so you can see right here, unfortunately, this nerve has been wiped out here. And so you can get but segmental focal areas. Here it's okay, here it's been wiped out. Now, again, this starts getting really confusing here. This is just, what do you think about this one, Caleb? So it looks like kind of the whole peripheral part of the disc is just kind of and I can see that the vessels kind of come over like this type of uh, raised uh, portion. And so, um, and then it's kind of just all the way around. So I would think more of like an optic neuritis. Yeah, so you could think again, depending on their age, kind of the same idea that we talked about, ischemic optic neuropathy, maybe even, uh, you know, area of inflammation, optic neuritis. And so this actually turned out to be, this patient had had uh, MS, and this was optic neuritis. And you can see here, there's a focal area in the optic nerve of demyelination. And so you often don't get diffuse demyelination of the entire nerve, you'll get focal areas. So you can see this has got this one kind of quadrant has been affected by the demyelinating process. And this just shows you in a longitudinal view. Here is an optic nerve sagittally here, and right here, <coughs> Again, is a focal area with demyelination affecting the nerves. And now, optic neuropathy, especially if it's associated with MS, is a waxing and waning entity. So you can get episodes where you get an acute episode and then it'll be calm for years and then you'll get another episode. And so when you guys do neuro-ophthalmology, you'll learn a lot about optic neuropathy and the various studies that have been done and how you treat it. And so you really need to know those cold. But bottom line is, is they did a very interesting study. They compared IV corticosteroids to oral steroids to just follow up. And it turned out that the IV, you know, you blast them for three days with IV corticosteroids, high dose followed by oral, actually the um, vision comes back quicker and the patients do better. But when you look at them at six months, it makes no difference in terms of their acuity at six months. But, you know, again, if you have visual loss, you'd want to have it come back quicker. But one of the things that came out of this study is they find out when you blast them with those IV steroids, their chance of getting MS is certainly delayed for at least a couple of years. It may not be cured. And so one of the advantages, too, is it delays the onset of MS. And so there's actually benefit to blasting them with those high-dose steroids, whatever that does, IV steroids. But it turned out if you just treat them with oral steroids, they not only don't do better, they actually do worse. <clears throat> so when these people come in, three days of IV steroids followed by oral steroids followed by a taper. And this is what you worry about in any disease affecting the optic nerve, either ischemic or inflammatory. What do we see in here? Um, I mean, we see like total loss of well, so uh, it looks like just total loss of uh, infarction of the optic nerve, and we see like edema as well in the subarachnoid space. That, believe it or not, that is not edema. That's just 
widening of the subarachnoid so space. And so this is optic atrophy. And so this is the <coughs> nerve sheath. And that subarachnoid space is really widened. So whenever you get loss of the optic nerve fibers of those axons, you get widening of that. And so this is just end stage. So this is an atrophic optic nerve. All right. We're going to get some. Oh, heck. We'll keep going. Just tell me what you see. So it looks like the left pupil is larger than the right pupil. More of a red reflex. It's probably because the pupil is bigger. And the pupil is a little bit displaced. Yeah. What direction is that eye displaced? Uh, superior uh, nasal in the left eye. Well, if you look at the light reflex, it's actually a little bit inferior. So it's displaced a little bit inferior. What do you make of the upper lid? Some ptosis, maybe even a little bit of fullness in there. So if you look, I mean, this is a youngster. She's, I think she's like 11 or 12. So what could be going on, you know, unilateral in an 11 or 12 year old in a, again, you got to start thinking, what are we lecturing about today? What's our topic? Okay, so what could be going on that could give you this set of symptoms? Um, multiple things going on, one for innervation to the extraocular muscles, then innervation to the, to the lid, and then probably... Um, so when you see an eye that's kind of sticking out, and maybe you've got a little fullness here, as if there's a mass behind it, that's what this all shows. And so this is consistent with a mass behind the eye. And then we look inside and we see this. Jeez, what is this? This is like there's power um, and a bunch of, um, is it like nasalization of the vessels? What else are we seeing here? It's going toward the macula. Uh, what else? That's not a artifact. Yeah, those are, those are posterior striations. Those are little, we call them wrinkles or folds almost. And so now, of course, people used to always get excited. They used to teach you know, us in the olden days that this meant there's a lesion you know, behind the eye, specifically in the muscle cone, when you see these striations. But it doesn't necessarily mean that. In someone who's hyperopic with a flat posterior surface of the eye, you can get the same thing. But this is actually that kit. And so when you see these striations in the setting of proptosis and other things, this is a sign that you want to look for a lesion in the muscle cone behind the eye. Now, this is what happens in the end stage of this lesion. Look at that nerve. That's a pale atrophic optic nerve. And that's because this is what the scan shows. So what are we seeing right here? Yeah, so large mass in the muscle cone. It's kind of fusiform. So given the history and the findings of that previous patient, what would you be concerned about here? Okay, given the History that we said before. Um, glioma. glioma. All right. So, you know, if you look in, in, in kids and in, in adolescents, teenagers, you know, lesions of the optic nerve in this area, those are optic nerve gliomas. In older people, they are usually meningiomas. Now, if you get one that's outside that group, then it it's really behaves totally differently. And so people usually say, well, these are kind of benign, they may not be aggressive. Well, if you see a glioma in a 70-year-old, that's a different animal. But, you know, in a younger person, you see this fusiform lesion. It's almost like it's not around the nerve. It's almost like it's in the nerve. And so this is an optic nerve glioma. <coughs> and here is that biopsy. Here's the nerve sheath. Here's the tumor within that optic nerve. And here you can see, this is one where they actually remove the eye. This tumor is growing out from the nerve, and it's kind of a sausage-like growth or fusiform growth. Okay, so, oh, you can take a stab if you want. How do we grade these? And if you don't, if you say, I have no clue, that's okay. I'm honestly not sure. Okay, no, no, that's fine. I'll just take a stab. So we typically grade these, grade one to four. Um, so okay. Right. What grade are most of the ones of the optic nerve? Most of them are pretty low, maybe one. 
Yeah, exactly. So, so when you think about these, these are astrocytomas. And so the worst astrocytoma, grade four is the glioblastoma, multiforme, that's in, you know, with the brain tumors. Those are really nasty. But these are grade one astrocytomas. And in fact, people call these juvenile pilocytic astrocytomas. Juvenile, obviously, because they're in younger people. What does pilocytic mean? Uh, hair like. So they've got these little, almost like little hair fibers in them, but they're low grade. You don't see mitotic figures in them. You don't see a lot of pleomorphism. They're very, very low grade. Some people would even say they're almost like a hematoma, kind of a benign growth. But if you look at these, oftentimes, especially if they go back through the optic canal, you'll even see remodeling of the bone in the canal, which means that these have been there for a long time. And so this is kind of hair-like, pilocytic. And here you can see them again. These are, believe it or not, astrocytes. Some of them will be kind of spindly shaped, some of them will be round. And they have a specific entity that goes along with them that you can recognize that you have to know. Catherine, what is this showing you? Um, it's, a it's a Rosenthal fiber. What the heck's a Rosenthal fiber? It's kind of a bunch of degenerative material that's in the cytoplasm of these cells. And so it's this pink intracytoplasmic inclusion material here. It's called Rosenthal fiber, and that's classic with these grade one astrocytomas, these optic nerve, you know, pilocytic gliomas. Now, here is one that you can see it's growing out from the optic nerve. It's even squeezing the optic nerve. So, you know, you can see how this is not really conducive to sight. The problem with the treatment of these is, okay, you can go in and remove them. Okay, then the eye's blind. Or you can just watch the tumor grow, and then the eye's blind. Or you can radiate them. These are really slow-growing tumors. They don't respond real well to radiation. And so you're kind of darned if you do and darned if you don't. The one thing we do worry about is sometimes you can get reactive meninges on the outside surface of a glioma. And so there might be someone, something's atypical, their age range is different. The orbital guys go in there and do a little superficial biopsy. And they'll take a biopsy of one of these, and then if you get this on a biopsy, you say, oh my God, that's a meningioma. No, it's the actual surface of the glioma down here where you get reactive changes of the meninges. And so the bottom line is if you're gonna do a biopsy, and, you know, Boopy and these guys are really good at doing that. Don't just get the surface. Go into the parenchyma to be sure. Here again, almost looks like a meningioma right here, reactive proliferation of the meninges. All right, Tina, what are we seeing here? So, similar to our other picture, but a different age group. So it looks like that eye, there's some inferior scleral show. You get the idea that that eye is proptotic. Um, there's fullness in the orbit, superiorly and inferiorly. So it just kind of looks like everything's being pushed forward. Okay. So you're worried about a, a nerve. You know, you're worried about something behind that nerve again pushing forward. Now, you look inside, and what do we see in here? It's the optociliary shunt vessel. Optociliary shunt. So, I mean, these can show up in central vein occlusions and other things, but in this setting, why would you get an optociliary shunt? Anything that is sort of compromising nerve vasculature, so like a meningioma would give you any of these? Exactly. So, I mean, if you, again, what are we talking about? We're talking about optic nerves. We're talking about an older person. So likely this is a meningioma. And meningiomas, again, they grow from the meninges, not from the inside of the nerve, but from around the nerve. So they slowly squeeze off and strangle the nerve. And so as that slow process is going on, oftentimes you'll get these little optociliary shunt vessels forming to try to get you know, blood um, out of the eye and then through that nerve from where it's being squeezed down and strangled. And so this is the classic appearance, what do we call this? The tram track sign. So you can actually see the nerve still there and then you see the widening of the meninges next to it. So kind of like the you know, tram going up, you know, with the tracks around it, you know, the tram wire. So they call this the tram track sign. 
This shows you a, a severe example. This actually is an exenteration, you know, where you remove the whole eye and orbital contents. Here's a little bit of nerve here, and here's this huge tumor, bilobe, growing out from the meninges behind the globe. All right, so Vaish, what do the cells look like? Um, so these are from the meningothelial cells. They look, um, they have a pinker cytoplasm, look kind of like squamous cells. Exactly, so they almost look like squamous cells. You know, they've got this nucleus. Notice the nucleoli, the clump chromatin, but the pink cytoplasm, and they tend to form these little worlds almost, almost like squamous cells do. And you can see if you look at this, people say, God, that kind of looks like squamous cells almost. What are these things, Caleb? These are somoma bodies. Somoma bodies. First of all, spell it. P-S-A-M-O-M-M-A. -M -M -A. Yeah, good. So somoma with P-S, <laughs> somoma bodies. So again, these are almost like, if you think of drusen, these are almost like um, concentric lamellar structures. They've got hyaline in them. Sometimes they have calcium in them. They almost look like, remember when squamous cells form those little squamous pearls? It's kind of the same idea here. And so these are called somoma bodies. And there's the meningothelial cells, and there's the somoma bodies. So these are a real classic tip-off that this is a meningioma. All right, what else can show up in the muscle cone back there? So you could have a... Um Um, oh my gosh. What other kind of cells live yeah. as the optic nerve goes back? Astrocytoma. No, oh, that's the glioma. Yeah. Um, schwannoma. Schwannoma, exactly. Remember, Schwann cells live back there. So it's very rare, but you can get a schwannoma right next to the nerve. It doesn't come off the nerve itself, but it's right next to the nerve. It's in the muscle cone. You can get a schwannoma, or what's the other proper word for schwannoma? <laughs> I, I know what you're talking about. I have no idea. Neurolimoma. And again, spell if you can spell that in somoma, you guys are doing well because there's <laughs> double M's in there. And so neurolimoma. Uh, let's see. No, this is an unfair question. That you, oh, this is a fair question for a, for a second year here. Um, what are the two growth patterns you have to memorize for schwannoma, neurolimoma? Exactly. And which one is this one? Okay, so see again, I'm OCD, I'm going to show it in order. <laughs> so Antony A is a swirling or fascicular pattern. And so if you look at these Schwann cells, they're almost spindly shaped, and they form this little swirling fascicular pattern. So that's Antony A. And then Antony B is a more mixoid. It's almost like there's a little bit of fluid in it and some other background materials in there. So this is an Antony B. And Antony is, is like, you know, the only pathologist who wasn't like German or Austrian or British, you know. I think he was Italian, I think. So in any event, Antony A is swirling fascicular. Antony B is more mixoid. Okay. And then we say hi to the penguins at the zoo. Um, next week, I hope it doesn't snow so I can get here on time. Next week is orbit. Okay. Questions on optic nerve. Thank you.